Okay. Um, I want to thank the organizers of this session, which uh, I'm really excited about. Um, not so much because of my contribution, but because of what the other speakers are talking about, which fits very much with the stuff I've been thinking about. And I want to thank you all for taking the time to come out on the last day of the meetings in the morning. Uh, I was at a session maybe five years ago or more um, where there was the head of the Archaeology Data Service and Greg Crane from Tufts and a whole bunch of really heavy hitters in the digital world and there were six people in the audience. So this is a, a welcome change and I hope a trend that is going to continue. I want to say two things before I begin. One is that you may notice that the dissemination has dropped out of my title, uh, which is a product of the length of time that I had. I'm happy to talk about those issues in the question and answer session for the paper. It's a main concern of ours, but I've decided to focus primarily on what we were doing in the field and how we've been dealing with our data afterwards for long-term preservation. And the second is, Bill was talking a lot about standards and metadata and matching vocabularies and descriptions of data to other projects. I'm going to talk about that a bit, but with reference to files rather than tabular information. So I'm not going to talk about field name standards. I'm going to talk about what you do with all of the stuff that you accumulate that's not inside your database, but managed by it. So what we'll be discussing today may not be as glamorous or as exciting, at least as, at first glance, as the most recent dig results, but it is arguably more important for our understanding of the past in the long term. All of us are familiar with archaeological archives. Many of us have used them for our own research, and some of us have generated them in the course of fieldwork. We're all familiar with the truism that archaeology, at least excavation, is a destructive discipline, and our results are usually only as good as our documentation. All of us are also familiar with digital technology. Even the most technophobic generally recognize the usefulness of digital photography or a spreadsheet program to capture or keep track of information. But many of us, and I count myself in this number, at least until recently, have not given much thought to the extent to which our digital data will be accessible, comprehensible, and reusable in the long or even in the medium term. I'd like to illustrate my point with a digital orphan. What can we say about this photograph? We can tell how large the object it depicts is, and a trained eye can see that this is a bone plaque with circular decoration. And we can see a number, which presumably refers to a catalog or a list. If we look at the file itself, we can see its name, here, underscore 370, which matches the tag in the photo, and when it was created or modified. Confusingly, this one was created two days ago, but modified at the end of July 2002. If we have access to the directory structure from which it came, we can see that it lives in a folder called number 01. And if we're project insiders, we know that it came from excavations at Kersenesis. Without a piece of paper or a digital record that tells us what number 370 means, that's all we can get. Compare this to an image taken at Kersenesis 100 years ago this year. The digital image is a scan of a glass plate negative that sits in a physical collection in the archive of the National Preserve of Tarek Kersenesis. It was accessioned to the collection and provided with general catalog information in a paper register meant to be a permanent part of the archive with catalog numbers written on the negative itself. The paper register is still accessible and provided the author and the description here. Now, you're probably thinking two things at this point. First, that this isn't a digital problem, it's a problem of bad record keeping and bad archeological recording. And second, that you yourself have found lots of images in physical archeological archives that had even less information attached than the photo of that bone plaque. Fair enough. This is indeed a record keeping problem and not inherent to a particular medium. On the other hand, the shift to digital media has had several effects that I think make these problems much greater for the future than they have been for the past. First, we are producing much more data. A digital photo costs almost nothing and requires almost no effort to create, while a glass plate negative involved a much more labor-intensive and costly process, so far fewer were made. The archive at Kersenesis houses around 12,000 glass plate negatives that reflect months of excavation carried out every year for more than 40 years. We produced more than 20,000 digital images in connection with five six-week excavation seasons. <laughs> 
Second, we are relying increasingly on digital systems to manage and describe our data instead of paper registers. This is faster and more efficient, and it enhances our ability to find and contextualize information, but it means we depend on those management systems to give our data meaning. Third, the data objects themselves have become much more complex, both in terms of proprietary formats and increasingly in terms of objects made up of several interdependent files. And fourth, it is much easier to copy, change, rename, or move around digital files than it is something like a paper plan or a glass plate negative. All these factors mean that traditional approaches to the archiving of archaeological documentation are not sufficient for the preservation of our data beyond the short term. They are even less suited for future reuse. You can't put all your hard drives in a box, leave them there for 100 years, and expect the archaeologist of the future to be able to pick them up, plug them in, and look at your data set in all its glory. The digital tools that have now been widely adopted make it possible for the least technically inclined of us to create data sets that are deeper, richer, more detailed, and more informative than the archaeological documentation we were producing even a decade ago. But this also makes those data sets more fragile. Fortunately, digital tools are emerging to counter that fragility and dispense with the shudder-provoking thought of a box of dusty 100-year-old hard drives holding your excavation's digital data. A great deal of progress has been made over the last few years in the development of both standards and infrastructure. You'll hear about several of these projects in the rest of this session, but I'd also like to mention Open Context and the Archaeology Data Service, which provide platforms both for the long-term preservation of data and for its interactive contextual publication. The libraries of a number of large research universities are also now developing institutional repositories to house data produced by faculty projects. And I've included here the Carolina Digital Repository, which houses Donald Haggis's archive for the Azoria project. Despite this progress, however, there is still a major gap in many cases between the data sets we're creating and their eventual archival homes. And a lot of information is likely to disappear into that gap if we're not careful. The gap is the product of human nature and the life cycle of multi-season archaeological projects. In a perfect world, that world where everybody follows the same standards, digital strategies, recording systems, and archival solutions are all planned in advance, and data are born not only digital, but appropriately formatted, provided with extensive metadata that follows ex established standards, and ready for ingest into a repository. This is what we should aim for, and indeed what funding bodies are beginning to require. Yet the rate of technological change, the volume, complexity, and often unexpected nature of data collected in the field, the long tail of data generated by projects that have moved into their study phase, and frankly, limited funding have made this ideal difficult to achieve in practice. I suspect that our orphaned plaque is less the exception than the rule. And I also suspect that there are many better organized data sets out there that are only one equipment failure or two software updates away from a similar fate. If you depend on your database to manage information, what happens when it doesn't work any longer? The custom access database that ought to have described the bone plaque itself uh, is now partially inoperable, although luckily most of the data it contained was exported before its decline. So the gap begins with the first major change in platform new software, new hardware, new methodologies, new management, that requires data from the previous stage to be reintegrated into a new system. It widens at the point in a project's life cycle when data collection in the field is over, but the data set is still being accessed, added to, and changed, and manipulated by researchers. And it continues through the point at which the whole collection, now complete and ready for archiving, has to be mapped to the metadata schema and format requirements of the repository where it will be stored for the future. The amount of person hours, technical expertise, and domain knowledge necessary to bridge the gap properly is immense. But paradoxically, this is often when the funding and energy those resources demand are at an ebb, especially for small or medium-sized academic projects. Larger ongoing projects, as Bill pointed out very clearly, can usually develop their own infrastructure to handle data from the dirt to the archive. To compound the problem, those three necessities, time, technical expertise, and the understanding of the data set and its contents, are rarely all present among the people immediately responsible for the data. And I show you this to make you panic slightly. 
This is the Psydoc CRM uh, ontology mapping of the collection of the British Museum. If you can do that with your project's data, more power to you, but most of us want to run screaming from the room when we see this. In the rest of this talk, I will present the history of our use of digital recording tools at Kersinesis to illustrate some of these challenges on a practical level. I will then talk about some of the solutions we have developed and end with what we've taken from the experience. Our project is, I think, a reasonably representative one, one step up from the size of the project that Bill was describing. So we are a medium-sized project. That is, we were funded well enough to afford technical consultants to build and run customized digital documentation and data management solutions, but only for a fixed term, and involving ongoing research by a diverse group of specialists after field work was complete. The project began in 2001 under the co-direction of Paul Arthur of the University of Salento and Larissa Sedikova of the National Preserve with my co-author Jessica Trelogan as surveyor and GIS specialist. In 2001 and 2002, its single context recording strategies involved paper context sheets and registers, the contents of which were supposed to be entered during the field season into a custom programmed access database, hand-drawn plans that were digitized and manipulated primarily in AutoCAD, but eventually also exported to ArcMap as shapefiles, and spatial data for the spine, fine spots of special objects, uh, levels, things like that, collected with a total station and managed entirely in ArcMap. There was also some experimentation with the georeferencing of vertical photographs in ArcMap. The resulting digital data set included the access database, digital photographs of excavation contexts and finds, some of the excavation context georeferenced with the attendant auxiliary files, scanned plans and sections, raw survey data files downloaded from the total station, AutoCAD uh, DWG files, GIS shape files, and illustrations of finds done in Adobe Illustrator. The collaboration with the University of Salento ended in 2002, and I arrived in 2004 to assume the role of co-director on behalf of the Institute of Classical Archaeology at UT Austin with Dr. Sedikova. We continued to employ a single context open area excavation strategy, but our use of digital tools changed in several areas. In 2003, ICA had begun a collaboration with LP Archaeology, a UK-based archaeological consulting firm, to develop a GIS-based digital conservation recording and assessment system. Since the Italian IT specialist who had developed the access database did not return, Stuart Eve at LP worked with us to develop a new database, initially still in access, then in MySQL with an access front end, into which the data from the original access database were imported. During the last field season, the database moved again into the web-based archaeological recording kit platform run at that time from a portable server we brought to Ukraine each summer. And here's the, the final version of this in its initial form. It's now in yet a different form, pulling this all together in an online environment. Our gap began with this first change in direction and database platform. I inherited the paper recording sheets from the 2001-2002 excavations, which had been completed, but not completely entered into the database. At least this didn't represent a loss of information. The photo <coughs> register, by contrast, disappeared from the documentation in the course of the transfer. And since it had never actually been entered into the database, the information that would have contextualized those photos disappeared. Again, this is not a digital problem. But the fact that the team assumed the photos would be fully described in the database meant that, A, information about the objects or layers represented was neither included in the frame of the photos. Remember chalkboards? We don't seem to use those anymore. Nor written on the edge of a slide or the back of a print. And B, the registers themselves seem to have been treated as temporary placeholders for the digital information rather than as fundamental parts of the archive. Our own recording strategies relied just as heavily on the use of digital tools to manage information. And we didn't use chalkboards either, so I'm not being holier than thou about this. This was especially true of the spatial component of the excavation, which was increasingly centered on GIS. By 2004, ArcMap had also been transformed, and the newer version, eventually to become ArcGIS, was able to communicate more easily with the database. This made it possible for objects in the Geo database to inherit descriptive information from the database database, and when we moved to Arc, for objects in the database to be displayed in a map within the database itself. And that was the last thing I showed you. Here's a map of the distribution of some things being pulled in from the GIS to this web interface. <coughs> 
As a result, we began to rely more on geo-referenced vertical photographs and topographical surfaces to collect information about individual contexts that would previously have been recorded with oblique photos and level markings on hand-drawn plans. In the last season, we replaced both geo-referenced photos and topographical surfaces with 3D models and ortho-rectified photos created with photogrammetry software. And then those were in turn exported to PDFs during the last round of data management to try to make them accessible to the public. In 2004, we also created context plans by digitizing geo-referenced photos in the lab, carrying out several tests of time and accuracy in comparison to hand-drawn plans. We concluded, however, that drawings done on paper in the field presented a different kind of interpretive information and should not be confused with photographic documentation. In fact, we made a decision fairly early on to maintain a parallel paper recording system with paper registers, context sheets, trench notebooks, and plans, which were later entered into the, into the database, digitized, or transcribed. This was dictated in part by technology. This was before the advent of tablets. But it was also a deliberate strategy that we felt was better suited to the cognitive process of interpretation and offered an increased chance for the long-term preservation of the data. It also guaranteed that our Ukrainian collaborators, who did not have consistent access to proprietary software or, at that point, to the internet, would retain a locally sustainable set of documentation. By the end of excavation, then, we had a digital archive consisting of an online ARC database, open source but customized and requiring a, requiring, requiring a web server with map serving capacity, say that 10 times fast, an ESRI geo database associated with a very large number of geo-referenced images, surface models, and 3D photo models, each with a series of auxiliary files and sometimes in several versions, and an even larger number of digital photographs, both of excavation and of finds of various types and at various stages in the conservation process. The excavation photos were all cataloged in the database in the field, but the finds photos were generated by a separate department in the National Preserve during conservation and were only later attached to the records of the finds they represented. This gap in the documentation workflow increased substantially during the following study seasons, as studio photographs and scanned or digital illustrations of objects and material rapidly accumulated, and specialists began to deposit idiosyncratically formatted spreadsheets that often included important information that did not fit into the structure of the existing database. It's probably not unfamiliar to many of you. As preliminary publications were produced, images from the data set were altered, duplicated, or renamed, joining backup versions of the spatial documentation from earlier seasons in a general proliferation of versions. Database management, not surprisingly, became a major issue during this period. The database had to be accessible online to off-site collaborators, but it also had to be modified structurally by the consultants as new information came in. And because of the software setup it required, we could only run it from the portable server on which it had originally been installed. All the information was backed up in multiple static copies, but if the server went down, the contextual system that made sense of it would have become inaccessible. Meanwhile, we did not have enough manpower to register the large number of incoming images in the database and ensure that they had names more informative than underscore 340. So systems that had met our needs very well in the field began to show increasing signs of strain during the study and publication stage. It was at this point that we began to think hard about the long-term future of the data. And this led to a collaboration with the Texas Advanced Computing Center, where my co-author and digital archivist Maria Esteva is based. TAC was interested in providing support for digital projects in the humanities, and they brought both programming resources and, un and an understanding of digital archives to the table. Our collaboration focused not on the mapping of database fields to a particular metadata schema for archiving, but on an attempt to organize the many files described in or managed by the database or geodatabase in such a way that information about them could be encoded independently of those platforms. We began with an inventory of our digital archive focused on the types of information we collected, the formats we collected it in, and its internal relationships. This allowed us to create both a directory structure and a naming convention that reflected our basic data categories and contextual connections more accurately. Our ARC database was then set up on the TAC servers, a lot of acronyms will follow, and the entire file collection was imported onto a server running IRODS, a rule-oriented data storage architecture. David Walling Attack wrote a script for IRODS that automatically created an XML document containing both technical and descriptive metadata, premise and uh, Dublin Core and METS, for those of you who care, for each file. 
The descriptive metadata was drawn from the file's position in the directory structure and from the file name, which linked it to an ARC record from which additional information was extracted. These XML documents and the checksums created for each file will help us keep track of versioning as files are added or changed, and they will ensure that the contextual relationships can be construct reconstructed when the current database platform becomes inoperable, as it surely will. Um, this is just an example of one of those XML documents. You'll be able to see this in the recording more at, uh, in detail, and I can answer questions about it later. Um, we're now exploring possibilities for the development of a standalone open source desktop toolkit that will provide triage tools to access, assess an existing collection, a graphic user interface that will allow drag and drop association of files with user defined ontologies, and a platform for the automated extraction of properly formatted metadata as XML or RDF, including basic Dublin core descriptive metadata drawn from user defined categories, directory structures, file names, and any associated database or spreadsheets that can be linked to file names. I'm gonna skip the rest of this paragraph. Happy to talk more about it. I hope that I will have the dispensation to read the last because the last of these paragraphs is really the most important message of this. And the message is as follows. We're trying to build this toolkit because it would put some of the responsibility for dealing with metadata in the hands of the data producers without requiring them to figure out the incredible intricacies of metadata schemata and ontologies, which are scary and they make you wanna not do stuff and they take a lot of time. So how do we make a tool that allows people on their desktop to organize information and automatically extract properly formatted, for formatted metadata in an XML document that they never have to read, but that somebody else can read, either a librarian trying to ingest the data set into a repository or somebody in the future who finds the hard drive in a box of dusty hard drives and is trying to figure out what the information is. And the key to all of this for us was finding the proper collaboration. Ours came late in the project, but the message that we have, the lesson that we learned, is start this at the beginning of your project. When you start planning, find a librarian or archivist who works with digital repositories, talk to that person, and develop together a strategy for the organization of your data, including all of these extra files and dependencies, that can then lead that data more smoothly into an archival solution at the end. And ideally, it'll be a solution that allows you to document as you go so that you're not suddenly scrambling at the end when you have no money, no students, and no time to provide all this documentation, but rather over the course of the whole process, you have a workflow that integrates archival documentation with field collection of data. Thanks very much. I'll, I'll just add, this is a picture with no data attached to it from those 100-year-old archives. We don't want this, and we definitely don't want less than this. I'll give three minutes for questions. Cut into our break. But. Okay, well then we'll move on. Thank you, Adam. Um, and there'll be time for discussion at the end. We have a little.